guys are going to have to bear with me. This is going to be a hard Sunday for me. Um, not a whole lot of youth pastors get to, to celebrate what we're about to celebrate. Um, this is my first class. I'm going to cry. <laughs> yeah, this is my first class to be with from freshman to senior year. You know, and the, the average lifespan of a youth pastor in one location is 18 months. So not a whole lot of youth pastors get to see uh, such an amazing group develop, grow, and become the amazing young men and women that you guys are. You know, we have lots of memories from road trips in Big Pimpin'. If you didn't know, they named our old people mover Big Pimpin'. You know, we used to, we used to take it to football games when they were freshmen. All the cra- nobody ever sat in their seat, ever. Um, from playing wiffle ball, I remember one of my favorite memories is Sam McKinley crushed a ball in wiffle ball and Callie got him out and I was just like, ha, ah, <laughs> you got out by a girl. Just <laughs> and then one of my favorite memories, Clayton doesn't like it when I share this story. One time before our trip, we were getting ready to go to a football game. Well, we had the wise idea to put everything on the side of the room and play football in our youth room with like one of those little foam footballs. So Red is the quarterback for the other team. He throws a touchdown pass, and he's celebrating. I was like, all right, give me the ball, and he throws it at my feet. It's like, all right, game on. So I tell everybody, just go gather around Red. I'm going to throw it as hard as I can. So everybody gets around Red, and this is how Clayton tells the story. I threw the ball, and he says the ball literally weaved in and out of everybody's heads and drilled him in the face. (laughs) So as I'm laying down on the ground, the next thing I know, like as the, the tears leave my eyes, Clayton has read in what he thinks is a leg lock, and he's yelling, I'm about to break it. I'm going to break it. <laughs> and it was phenomenal. It was amazing. <laughs> Something I'll never forget. Um, I, I do want to say this. Uh, you will not meet a deeper senior class. These, the depth of these people, of these students and the heart for Jesus and their heart for God and the heart for advancing His kingdom is phenomenal. It is amazing. It's what makes this, makes this it's exciting, but it's what makes it hard. Um, so let's do this. <laughs> Every year we give a scholarship to our seniors. We give, it's, it's based on your dedication, not just, there's a $200 uh, scholarship dedicated from the river, if you're dedicated and committed to attending, and then there's one from React. So what we do, the way that we like to bless our kids is we like to give them money as they go, and, and they go after their future, they go after their purpose. So I want to recognize, I want to call you up, I'm going to hand you the mic for a brief, I want you to tell where your, go, brief statement, I want you to tell where you're going and what your degree is. So first... I have Kaylee Bella, and you can clap for them as they come up. I plan to go to WT and hopefully major in nursing. Good start, man. Jack Cates. I feel like I'm handing you a diploma. I plan to go to South Plains for two years and then become a physical therapist. Kinsley Choate. Uh, I'm going to Frank Phillips to play basketball and I'm going to major in kinesiology. Abby Durham. Um, I'm going to go to Tarleton State, and I'm going to major in biomedical sciences. Kennedy Helfenbein. Did I say it right? <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Amarillo and attend Wade Gordon and do cosmetology. <laughs> Callie James. Uh, I'm going to go to Texas Tech, major in nutrition, and from there be a physical therapist also. Sam McKinley. (laughs) 
I plan to attend Mid American Nazarene and play football and uh, major in physical education. Colby Roach. I plan to attend, attend WT and major in business management. Patrick Shaded. I plan on going to WT and majoring in business, business management also and minoring in computer science. Kami Witt. I plan on going to WT and uh, majoring in special education. Red Huey. Um, I'm going to attend McPherson College and play football and major in communications. And as you can tell, his leg is okay. Clayton never broke it. Clayton Wood. Uh, I plan to go to WT, major in music performance, and then from there go to either Elevation Worship or Bethel and play the drums. We have future doctors, future teachers, future world changers, cosmetologists, all, all the way around businessmen. We have this, this, this class is going to reach the world. They're absolutely going to reach the world. So in, in going after that, I want to ask that we extend our hand and we want to pray a blessing over you guys. As, as you guys, man, this, is, this may be the, the end to your high school chapter, but it's the launch into, the, into life. It's the launch into you going after your goals. And the, the enemy wants to take your dreams away, and don't let them. They're too precious, way too precious. So if you guys will extend your hand, we'd love to pray a blessing over these guys. So dear Holy Father, God, I thank you for each and every one of these students, God, and even the students that, that aren't here, God. And God, we just say, we just say thank you for, for putting them in each and every one of our lives, God, because they each one of them bring a different aspect of life. They each bring a different aspect of joy, of creativity, of, of love, God, even love, God. So we say that we, we ask that you, that you make their steps firm, God. The Bible says that for those who delight in the, the Lord, he'll make their steps firm. So we speak that over them. We speak that every dream that, that, that you give them, that they accomplish, that, that, that no dream is too big, no task too hard, but with, if you are with them, nothing can oppose them. So God, we launch them into the world as you launch them into the world, and we, we partner with the fact that they're going to change it that they're going to reach the, the nation, that they're not just going to reach specific areas. They, they, will, they will change the world. They will very literally change our nation. God, we thank you so much for them, for their hearts, for their passion, for their excitement. God, we give you all the honor and glory, and we ask that you bless them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I uh, also have got to just watch you guys and just watch you grow and and uh, you were you were at the really weird stage whenever I got here that really awkwardness. Some of you have left it and some of you haven't. <laughs> I'll let you decide who that is. No, I, I just want to say to you, I, I before you guys get up and leave, I just. I, I'm going to give you a chance to get up and go and change and take that off if you want and get back in here quickly so you can hear the message, all of it. But I just, before you go, I just want to say, man, what a blessing you guys are. Obviously, you individually have, each one of you have impacted my life for sure. But I, I just want to thank every one of you for the impact that you've had on my family. Man, as a, as a, you know, I want to speak to you as a pastor and bless you as a pastor, but I want to speak to you as a dad and say thank you so much for the impact you've had on my family. Man, I, words cannot say 
how blessed I am by you guys. And so I celebrate you and I celebrate your families. I celebrate what you're going to go and do in life. You're going to go do amazing things. And I love who you are. I want you to know that there is a battle for your destiny. There is absolutely a battle for your destinies. And you, the enemy will not win. You will do amazing things for the Lord. Because I do know each of you. And I know that the Lord's hand is heavy on every one of you. And so I just celebrate who you are. You guys go change clothes. But I just want you to know I love you and I celebrate you. So... As they're going out and doing that, I, I, I really quickly, I want to I wanna touch on one thing because the Lord was super, man, he was just really heavy on me about this. If you're visiting with us, I just, uh, just indulge me for a second, but I, because I want to speak to our members. I want to tell you, as you, first of all, I have, to have, I have to apologize because I led us into a difficult time with with some hesitancy on my part and you did what you normally do you you blew my mind and you just you just taught me that I need to be better at trusting us as a body because as we went into the blessed life series I want to tell you I did that with with a, a great level of difficulty inside because first of all we were watching some videos and secondly we were watching some videos over a very difficult subject. And I want to tell you, in my communications with Gateway, and as I talk to them about what, uh, what they've experienced and what they've seen, they are really, really good at measuring things and at, and at keeping metrics. I want to tell you, as I have communicated with them, the river is one of the, is one of the highest measuring numbers of the change of heart that has gone on in churches of churches that they've measured it has been it has been amazing if you're visiting I'm talking we came out of this series about called the blessed life and it was a dealing with finances and about giving it was dealing with the tithe and I just want to tell you the Lord has completely removed the difficulty of my part of discussing that because there has been such a violent turning of the hearts of our people that that as the heart of our people turned towards God in this area it's been profound it's been amazing and what happens I just want to tell you this really quick because I want you to testify for each other. What happens, the scripture says, where your treasure is, your heart is. And whenever there is a turning of, you can't invest your treasure without investing your heart. When there is such a violent turning of the hearts of a body towards God, then what happens is, is we get to hold God to what he said. The Lord said, I didn't say it, the Lord did. He said, test me in this and see if I will not, listen, throw open the windows of heaven and pour out on you such a blessing that you won't even be able to contain it. I, I'm telling you, there has been a profound turning of the heart and there is absolutely, so here's the prophetic word I want to speak to you as a body. There is a window of heaven opened up over you and the Lord is pouring out blessings right now over this church in such a profound way and I want to show you if you are here and you I'm not going to embarrass you I'm going to embarrass you maybe a little but I'm not going to make you say anything but if you're here and you have experienced some of those blessings you've seen the Lord do some some amazing things over the last couple of weeks we just started this but if you're here and you've seen God open up the windows of heaven and you've seen some of these blessings poured out on you over the last several weeks, would you just testify by standing up? I want everybody around to be able to see who you are. I just want you to be able to see. Look at this. See the blessings that have been poured out. It is amazing. So thank you guys very much for standing up. Listen, I'm telling you, the reason that I felt like the Lord was so clear to tell me to do that was because 
When you, when you stand up and you testify, the scripture says this in Revelations, when you testify about what Jesus has done, that is the spirit of prophecy. And what prophecy is, is prophecy is a doorway. When you speak a prophetic word over someone, which is what every one of you just did when you stood up. Prophecy, when you prophesy over someone, you paint a doorway of opportunity in front of that person. And then it becomes solely dependent upon the person that hears the prophetic word if they choose to step into that doorway of opportunity or not. What you just did was you prophesied about what the Lord is doing, how he is pouring out favor because there is still people in the room that you are at difficult times. You are at desperate times. You need to trust the Lord too and walk into those places of prophetic words that those people just stood up and said because there is a window. There is a financial blessing that the Lord is pouring out over this body right now and every single one of you have the opportunity and you need to participate in it. It's an amazing thing. I had a woman last week bring up a letter and she said, I just want you to read this. I opened it up and it was a letter from a hospital. She said, we had no idea that this was coming. She had a $26,000 bill from BSA Hospital. And this letter said, we have evaluated, blah, blah, blah. Your bill is paid 100%. She had a $26,000 bill that was just deleted last week. I know that there are people that scoff. I'm just saying, scoff as you want. I'm in. I want Jesus, I want his blessing on me. I want him to cover me. I had another amazing phone call this week. I won't bring out any names, but I had an amazing phone call and someone said, hey, I have some people coming to town. I, I need a place to put them up for a month. I need a place for them to stay because there's no hotel rooms uh, available for them to rent for a whole month. And so I need a, a nice place for them to stay. And by the way, I want to make sure wherever they stay, whoever the people that are going to put them up for the month, I want to make sure that they're tithers because I want the blessing of God on these people as they're in town too. I'm just telling you, that's an awesome testimony. The Lord blesses that and blessings follow that. And so I celebrate that. And that is just a beautiful testimony as to the heart of people and what God's doing. So I want to shift from that into where we are today. We're beginning this new series today called Live Life because that's what God has called us to do. He's called us not to exist in life, not to muddle through life, not to stumble through life, or to just, you, to just ups and downs, good days, bad days. He's, that's not God's plan. His plan is for us to live life. And so here's the deal. We are supposed to dictate to life how things go, not have life dictate to us how things go. It's a drastic change. And the way we get into this change is by living life on purpose. So I want to start out like this. If I were to ask you individually, one-on-one, -on -one, what do you value the most? And, and let's just say I asked you that question out of this room. Because in this room, we would say things like, well, I value church, pastor, or I value, you know, whatever. We'd come up with some cheesy religious line that didn't really have any weight to it. If I were to ask you, what do you value the most? I wonder what your answer would be. Some of you know the answer to that. Some of you like the answer to that, and some of you really don't. In fact, for some of you, it's a pretty difficult question because whether you know it or not, some of you are like, I'm not, I'm not sure I really even know what I value. You guys better listen because this is fixing to radically change in your life. You have valued up until this point what you were told to value. You're about to start finding out how to value things for yourself. And if you don't value things the right way, it's going to send you to a whole different place. A value system. If I were to ask you what you valued, I wonder what the answer would be. And then let me say this. What if I were to take your family 
your friends, those that are closest to you, and I were to pull them away from you and put them in a different room, and I were to ask your friends and your family, what do they, what does he or what does she, what do they really value the most? I wonder if the answer would be the same. I wonder if what you said you valued the most would be the same thing as what those around you said you value the most. Because the chances are most of us don't have this value system lined out. Most of us don't value or, or we think we value or we say we value something, but reality is we don't value it. What we say and what we do don't match up. So our value system is what tells us what's important, but too often we don't know what that value system says. So I want to do this for you. I want to put a definition of a value system up here. I want you to read this with me. A coherent, a value system is a coherent set of values adopted by a person, organization, or society as a standard to guide its behavior and preferences in all situations. Now, if I just left it at that, you would leave the room and you would go, I don't even know what that meant, what all that said. So I'm going to do you a favor. I want to break it down for you because it's important for you to understand this. You need to know what your value system is. So broken down, it's this, a coherent. Coherent simply means logical or well organized or better yet, easy to understand. A gu to guide its behavior and preferences in all situations simply means this. In other words, the way they live life. So if you put it all together, it's this. An easy to understand guide of what is important that is adopted by a person or an organization or society as a standard for the way they live life. What's your standard? I'm asking, what is the standard by which you choose to live life? If you think of it like this, think of it like a, a bowling alley. When you go bowling, you have an option. You can bowl in the regular lanes or you can bowl in the other lanes where you pull the lever and the bumpers come up. It's a whole lot easier to bowl in this lane because you can bowl, you can Put a spin on it. You can bowl backwards. You can bowl sideways. It doesn't matter. No matter how you bowl in that lane, the bumpers are going to assure you that the ball is going to get where you want it to get. You may not always get a strike, but the ball's going to get down the lane and hit some pins. And that's the goal. And so we have to have this analogy because what I'm saying to you is in life, we are, we are bowling in one lane or another. I'm afraid that most of us are bowling in the lane without the bumpers. And so if in this analogy, those, the, that gutter is the, those places of sin that are always a part of our life. Sin is, is calling us to one side or calling us to the other. And we are worried. We're so going through life. We're trying to figure out how do I stay out of the gutters of this sin? How do I stay out of these places that so draw me in? In fact, the scriptures tell us that we're supposed to live a life that causes us to avoid those places. That says the sin that so easily entangles. And if you bowl like me, something about that gutter is just so drawing to the ball whenever I roll it. No matter how hard I try, I'm not very good at it. And some of you, most of you, would stand up and say the same thing about the way you live life. No matter how hard I try, I keep getting drawn back into this place. I keep experiencing the same labels. Decisions that I made from my past try to still label me from my future. My friends try to label me. The enemy everywhere I go is trying to label me. And so how do we overcome this? I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 6. Paul is talking about this same thing here. And look what he says. Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I want to tell you, this is a profound question. 
This is a really good question. In fact, it's a question that we ought to spend a little bit of time thinking about. He's asking a question. Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? So let's do this. If you think that grace is an important thing, if you think that the grace of God is an important thing and it's something that you want to experience, would you just raise your hand? I want to see if anybody missed. Okay, good. Everybody's hand. Because we all recognize that the grace of God is good. But let, let me ask you this. What causes grace to be seen? What causes grace to be recognized? Sin. You see, without sin, how do you even recognize what grace is? Because grace is that thing that covers that up for us. Grace is that thing that enables us to be something other than what sin tells us we are. So, in order for you to really understand what grace is, you need sin. So Paul is asking, in order for grace to grow, for grace to abound, for grace to get bigger, we really need sin. So what should we do? Should we just continue to sin? Even better, here's what I think he's really asking. Should we continue, listen to me close, should we continue to let sin be an issue for us? That affects every one of us. Because here's what I think Paul's saying. I don't think Paul is saying, should we just continue to live in sin? I think he's saying, should we continue to let sin be an issue for us so that grace can abound? Let's look what he goes on to say. Verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Or don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? I want to tell you, this little verse right here, there's so much confusion. And because there's so much confusion over this verse, we do not walk in our destinies as believers. This verse is so important. Leave it there. I want you to see. This verse says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Listen to me, church. This verse is not talking about what Marley Leland did this morning. It's important for you to get this so that you can understand our, what God has called us to. This verse is not talking about baptism in the waters. This verse is talking about being baptized into Christ Jesus, which is what happens whenever you accept Jesus Christ into your heart as your Savior. When you accept Him into your heart, when you pray and you say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I accept you in my heart as my Savior. Listen, that is when you are baptized into Christ Jesus. Church, listen to me. And that is when sin becomes of no effect to you anymore. But until you begin to live like that, you will never walk in what God has called you to walk in. I had a friend that used to describe Satan. We would talk about Satan and he would say, man, he's the master of smoke and mirrors. He's the master of setting things up to look like they really aren't. He's the master of making things look like something other than what they really are. And listen to me, because there's only two groups of people in this room. The first group of people is this. There are people in this room that have never asked Jesus Christ to live in their heart and be their Savior. Listen, you are in desperate trouble. You need to accept Jesus Christ in your heart. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. You're in trouble without him. And there's another group of people in this room, and that's those of you that have accepted him. And what I'm saying to you is, by the time we finish reading this verse, you need to recognize that sin is not your issue. It's the only thing that will free you up to be what God's called you to be. Look what it goes on to say in verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, watch this, we, so we also should walk in the newness of life. And I want to tell you that I believe because of confusion over this message, most people, most people that have accepted Jesus Christ never get to the place that they walk in the newness of life. That's what God's, that's what God set life up to be like. That Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, not just Sunday morning at church, but every day of your life, you have been given this blessing to walk in the newness of life. But most of us don't. Most of us do not walk in our destinies. Why? Let's go on and see. Verse 5. For if we had been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this... That our old man was crucified with him and that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin. We are not called to be slaves to sin. When you're a slave to someone, you live under it. It is constantly over you. There's no time out. There's no break. When you live under something, you are a slave to it. You, if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, are not called to be a slave to sin. So how do you get out? Look what he goes on to say, verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So who is it that died? I'm glad you asked. Verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with him. My question to you, church, is this. When is that? When are you going to do that? Most Christians believe this verse is talking about what's going to happen when we die. And I'm going to tell you clearly, listen to me. That's a cop-out for you to not ever walk in what God's called you to walk in. That's a cop out to say, well, I'm going to live in my newness of life. I'm going to be all these things. I'm going I'm to live with him someday when I die. You see, that's a cop out for you to not do what God's called you to do. That's not talking about someday when you die. That's talking about today while you're alive. So how, how does this work? Knowing. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, that means just like him. You and me are supposed to live like him. Likewise. You also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12 is the key. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lusts. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. The only way you're ever going to do this is when you come to the place of understanding of what your salvation is. So I'm going to go back to the bowling analogy. Listen, the only way you're going to stay out of the gutters of sin is if you allow to have happen what the Bible says can happen. The Bible says salvation springs up from the ground. Salvation springs up from the ground in the gutters of sin. It springs up from the ground just like those bumpers that prevent you from going into it. So whether or not you recognize it is the only point. I'm saying you can't go into it. So as soon as you recognize that you can't go into it it'll start allowing you to be free from it. That's so much better than you reacted just telling you there's freedom from you for you 
Actually, there's freedom from you. Because guess who is your own worst enemy? You. If you could hear your father today, listen to me. He would say to you, stop beating yourself up. I'm so crazy about you. By the way, I died on the cross to set you free from all of those things that keep sucking you back in two. I died on the cross to set you free from those shackles that keep you bound. I died on the cross to give you freedom from being what the enemy of your soul is constantly, relentlessly telling you that you are. I died on the cross once to set you free from sin forever. So I'm saying to you this today. If you will allow yourself to live within the parameters of your salvation... It will set you free to walk in the newness of life. Sin doesn't have a grip on you. Man, you should have seen the question marks go up in the room when I said, well, yes, it does. Oh, no, it doesn't. Not if you've got Jesus Christ in your heart as your Savior. I was going to go read another passage from Matthew chapter 25, but I'm already late, so I'm not going to. But I'm going to say this to you. If you go back and read it in Matthew 25, there's a parable about 10 virgins that are going out to meet the bridegroom. And listen to what it says. It says the bridegroom was prolonged. Why was he prolonged? Because he wanted to make sure that everybody came. The reason that Jesus is waiting on coming back for all of us, the way that we all sit around and we're like, Jesus, come back, come back. But Jesus is going, I can't come back because what about him? What about her? What about her? You should be telling him and her about me and then I can come back. Can I just say this? I don't want to hurt your feelings, but can I just say this? When's the last time you led somebody to the Lord? When's the last time you invited somebody to come to church with you because you get life. If you're not taking life out to the world, who is? The mantra, the, the, the MO of this church is to live life because from, from Ezekiel 47, 9, wherever the river flows, Everything will live. The only way that happens is when you grab life and you take it out there. Wherever the river flows is wherever you go when you leave these doors. If you're not taking Jesus out into the world with you because you live in the safety of the parameters of your salvation, if you don't recognize that your salvation is complete and that it frees you up to go out and to carry Jesus into the world with you, then listen to me. The world is in trouble. I just want to say this to you. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you when this service is over. Awesome, but listen to me. I want to say this to you. You are not gripped by the things that you think you're gripped by. There is not a spirit of addiction in this room strong enough to keep you bound to anything that Jesus Christ has set you free from. There is not a spirit. In fact, in in the name of Jesus, we just dismiss the spirit of addiction from this room. The spirit of addiction has no authority over you. Not in any area. Stop giving it any credence. You don't have to live under that. That's not who you are. You are the righteousness of God. That's who you are. Let's pray together. Father, to live life is what we believe you've called us to do. (laughs) To live life. Not to fight with other church people over, well, we think this and we think this. Not to, not to hammer each other over, over the stupidest things. But God, to be Jesus in the world. Father, I pray for freedom to reign in this place today. I pray that those people that came into this room bound up by the spirit of addiction for whatever it is. I pray that they would find freedom in this room today. I pray that those people in this room that know you, that that they have accepted you as their Savior, but they still live life bound by what sin says. I pray for freedom for them. 
What we are supposed to look for is one thing. There are so many things bidding for our attention in this world, but only one thing matters, and that's Jesus. I just, I wish we could get that, that there is freedom. I don't care if you need healing, go to Jesus. If you need provision, go to Jesus. If you need love, go to Jesus. If you need restoration, go to Jesus. Because in Jesus is everything you are looking for. You need freedom, go to Jesus. You need hope, go to Jesus. You need love, go to Jesus. You're not looking for your healing. You're not looking for death. You don't have to worry about death. You don't have to look for the end. You don't have to look for a greater president. You don't have to look for a better Congress. You don't have to look for the stock market to get better. Just look for Jesus. Father, come meet with us. Come speak to us in this room today. And I pray for all those that don't know you as their Savior. Let today be the day of salvation for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.